Well, I did it. I said I was going to do it and I did it. I'm forever making random comments when I'm talking about authors like, oh, yeah, that's easily in the top five authors of all time. Or they're probably one of my favorites or et cetera, et cetera. And I did it just recently in a video and I said, I'm just going to have to stop saying this. I'm going to have to put my money where my mouth is and make that list. So here we are. I welcome you to the top 10 authors of all time. Now, of course, there's no such thing. And of course, I can't say that because I haven't read all of the authors out there in the world. This is just my list of my favorite authors. And this is actually a tricky list to put together because how do you quantify who is better than the other? How do you quantify which one that you like better than the other? Some of these are technically proficient. Some of them, I don't know if they are. Some of them are highly regarded award-winning authors. Some of them maybe not so much it really is just who speaks to me and who i connect with on a level where i just want to continue to read more and more and more of their books and i just really adore them so what works for me might not work for you and what works for you might not work for me your list could be vastly different this is just mine now here we are and i'm setting this list down stamping it in stone in the year of our lord 2024 but with the intention of updating it in the future because that's the point right that's why we read is to constantly be reading more books better books more authors better authors hopefully this list will expand as time goes on or people will get knocked off because somebody new comes along hell Two of these authors that I put on this list are brand new authors that I just read this year, and they're so good they overtook some of the people on my list. Then there's also, I have a very big problem. My problem is there are so many people that I get excited to read. I read one of their books, and it's like a 10 out of 10, and then I'm like a kid with shiny dangly keys over here, and I see some other author, and I'm like, ooh, and I go read one of their books, and it's like a 10 out of 10, and then I go read this author. There are like 30 authors as I was going through my list of like people that could easily be on this list, but I've only ever read one of their books, and it's so hard to be like, yes, they are the greatest author of all time based on that one book that I read that one time, you know? And I mean, some of those so just a shout out to some of those people that very well could show up on this list later in the future because they're so good but i can't i just can't bring myself to say best of the best based on one book and it's some people it's like some real heavy hitters it's like eric larson cormac mccarthy neil stevenson alistair reynolds Clive Barker's on there, although technically I've read two of Clive Barker's books, and even technically Ursula K. Le Guin falls onto the list of people who write great books, but I've only ever read one, so it's hard to put her on the list. Now with all that setup and preamble and all that extra stuff out of the way, let's get right into the list with number 10, H.P. Lovecraft. Now, I'm going to say Lovecraft is something special. He create there is a reason he created an entire universe and people still continue to write in that universe and people continue to still attempt to write lovecraftian horror or they put it right on the poster for movies you know something comes out with a tentacle monster and it's like the lovecraftian horror monster of whatever and this has been going on now for what over a hundred years that people have just been obsessed with him his world and his writings and there is good reason for it it is just dripping with atmosphere and tension and it's just so creepy and weird to get into his writings and his worlds i read one story which was color out of space and i was just like this is i need more i need more of this in my life this writing is so investing and engrossing it's amazing then people advertise their stuff as oh this is lovecraftian horror and i think people think just because they have like a tentacle monster in their um stuff that it's lovecraftian but i would argue that lovecraft himself and his writing is so much more than that it's just that dense atmosphere it's like a wall of atmosphere that you have to penetrate just to get into these books you're like man and it's partly the prose partly the writing partly i don't know what it is it's just there's a whole stigma around not even a stigma that's the wrong word there's just a whole atmosphere around the 
work itself once you get in there. It is wonderful. They're so great to just exist in for a couple hours at a time. I just, wow, HP Lovecraft. That's all I got to say. Now, moving on to number nine, and this is going to be one of the brand new authors that just made it onto this list this year, and that's going to be Mervyn Peake, author of the Gormenghast trilogy, the one that I just read this year, and oh, oh, it's so good. I can't even say enough about it. It is phenomenally written. It is like, I think I said when I did the video for that, that it is like... He's painting pictures for you in your mind, but he's using words to do it. It is just poetry in motion. Speaking of poetry, you will be in the middle of a scene and somebody will be like, talk, two people will be talking in a room and out of nowhere, one of them will literally burst into poetry. And normally I'm one of those people that poetry and singing and songs and stuff like that being injected into literature is real hit or miss with me. Sometimes I'm in and I'm on board and I'm right there. I'm all in like, this is great. And other times I'm like skimming through the songs and the poetry because it's just like, okay, that was fun. Let's keep going, guys. Oh, uh, you know, so hit or miss. I'm not pro and I'm not anti-poetry, but this stuff in Mervyn Peake's work is so good. You're not skipping the poems in his work. At least I wasn't. I thought they were fabulous. The writing, the words. Then there's also atmosphere in that as well because it's so strange and it's so gothic and it's so just you get invested and i enjoyed every second of being in this world and in this castle and these characters and they're so strange and they're so unique ah it was just the best thing ever and i've only ever read that trilogy of books from him i don't care he's getting on my list of top 10 authors of all time because that actually i don't even know if he's written anything else that might be the only thing he's ever written i'd have to look that up but either way doesn't matter phenomenal phenomenal work phenomenal prose phenomenal everything super good what am i trying to say mervyn peak next up is number eight and that's going to be another person with truly truly fabulous writing truly fabulous prose and that is ray bradbury it's hard to even put together how great of a writer ray bradbury is even when it comes down to something like Fahrenheit 451, which I have said many times over the years, is probably my least favorite of the big three dystopian novels like 1984, Brave New World, and Fahrenheit 451. Probably my least favorite of those three books, but easily has the best prose out of those three books just because Ray Bradbury as a writer is just amazing. Then take something like Something Wicked This Way Comes, which is just one of the greatest horror books ever, spooky season Halloween style stories, just because of the way that it is written and the language that he uses in that book. And then it's about these two boys. It's kind of like a coming of age, but it's also kind of like a boy and his father story. But then it's also got the creepy carnival. It's so good. It is a masterwork in just Halloween atmosphere. And then the prose and the way that he structures sentences and just the the scene of the boys sneaking out in the middle of the night and watching that carnival be put up in the middle of the night. Just one of my, just, I, I stopped in the middle of that scene like, this is the greatest thing ever just reading how he describes the oh my god so good so good the whole the whole the whole book's great i don't know what i'm saying but anyway ray bradbury's on here mainly just for his sentence structure and his writing is just that good next up at number seven is frank herbert this is one kind of on the flip side of that i don't think his writing is necessarily that special. I don't think his prose is necessarily that special. I don't think there's anybody that's going to argue that he's got some of this grand writing style that stands head and shoulders above any other author out there. But what I will say is his world building is on a level that's hard to compare to many other people. Just look at that Dune universe that he created in just six books and how what it does 
with the universe and how it's written and the history of that universe and the implications of that universe and the philosophizing that he's going to get into while he's developing this world building will make your head spin at times. It's crazy. And then the six books that he did write span something like three or four thousand years. It is a just, and you get to see the evolution of these houses and these planets and these, oh my gosh, it is a master class in world building, universe building, and just watching it play out. And then, like I said, he's going to philosophize about the civilization and what it means and what, you know, different, oh my, God, it's so hard to, I can't even get into it in this video. Wonderful. And like I said, I could see somebody taking issue with his writing style, especially it's so strange because you will be bouncing ping ponging from person's head to person's head and you'll be getting all these internal monologues one right after the other, all while getting, it's very jarring to some people. I didn't even notice it. Actually, I read through the first book and I was like, that was a good book. And then I heard people talking about it. Like it was so weird going from person to person to person. I'm like, Oh yeah, he did do that. Didn't he? Like, I don't know. It didn't, didn't phase me a bit. I was on board from page one, but it can be jarring for some people because it is a pretty different writing style to a lot of other offers, offers, authors reading um, Frank Herbert. So I think it's fabulous though. And it's, that's just me. Moving on to my number six author of all time, and it's my other one that is absolutely brand new to this list, just showed up this year, and that is Ken Liu. And he is the author of The Dandelion Dynasty, and he has a couple of books of short stories out that he's also written, like The Paper Menagerie. I started reading with The Grace of Kings, the first book in The Dandelion Dynasty. I was immediately enthralled, immediately invested. Then the next month, I think the Patreon pick for that month was The Paper Menagerie. So I was literally reading at the same time The Wall of Storms and The Paper Menagerie. I'd read a few chapters here, read a short story here, read a few chapters here, read a short story here. And it was easily one of the greatest reading experiences, that like two week block that I have had this year, hands down. It was such a good experience. And then he's got these worlds and these world building that he's doing in the Dandelion Dynasty. Phenomenal next level. But then his character work is so good and he will get you locked into a character just so quickly. It gets to the point where you're in, what's that book called? The Veiled Throne, and he's like introducing, he, oh, he's opening that book, introducing new characters in a world that's already got so many characters. He's like, dude, stop introducing new characters. Can't take any more. And then you're locked in. You are so invested now in the new characters while still juggling all the old ones. It's wild what he's able to do. And then in the short stories of the Paper Menagerie, he will just break you in like 20 pages. He'll give you a 20 page short story. You will be crying by the end of it. I don't know how he does it. I'm not a big crier at books. It is hard to make me cry in a book. It's something about the nature of him reading a book. Just it's just not something that really makes you cry easily. But there are books out there that'll get you, like The Road. Yeah, if you can make it through The Road without crying, you probably don't have a soul. That's all I'm going to say. Anyway, Ken Liu can do it. He, it just, two, two of those short stories got me. I thought, man, you're a son of a bitch. Anyway, number, what was that? Six, Ken Liu. Moving on to number five, and it is Gene Wolfe. Now... Gene Wolfe is another one. I've only read four of his books, and that is The Book of the New Sun, which is easily one of my top. I think it took number three on my list of the greatest book series of all time. It is so good. It's so masterfully written. It is so dense and weird and confusing and atmospheric. And then you're looking at this strange fantasy world that's set in a post-apocalyptic future world of weird technology, but you're looking at it through this veil of strange language and mystery. And some people have a problem. This is another one. Some people are really going to have a problem with the book of the new sun. It is written 
so it is intentionally difficult to read and that's really off-putting for some people he will find an obscure ancient word with a couple of different definitions and then he'll take the lesser known and lesser used definition and use the word to represent that just to make it intentionally difficult to understand and that is very off-putting for a lot of people for me it made it into this weird, strange sounding mystery of eclectic, weird shit that I didn't even, sometimes I didn't understand it and I didn't even try to research it. I just let it be weird and I just enjoyed what it was. I, it's hard to explain. But anyway, that just alone, it was just a masterwork. And I haven't even read Earth of the New Sun yet. Like it's on my list that I wanted to read it this year. I never got to it, at least not yet. And just, blew my mind. Now, I could see Gene Wolfe moving either up this list or down the list when I move on to like Book of the Long Sun or Book of the Short Sun or if I read more and it's just all as good as the Book of the New Sun, I could easily see him moving up on this list. If it's kind of lackluster, I could see him moving down. But anyway, as of right now, number five, absolute master. Moving on to number four, and that is Kazuo Ishiguro. Now, Kazuo Ishiguro is that utter award-winning, prize-winning author that I was kind of hinting at in the beginning of the video because Kazuo Ishiguro is a Nobel Prize award-winning author and he absolutely deserves that award like 10 times over. He is that good at writing, in my opinion. I just, I, I have not stopped singing the praises of Clara and the Sun ever since I read it a couple years ago, and I've just moved on to read more of his works, and you end up with, if you want more in the vein of like the sci-fi, like that one, then you've got your Never Let Me Go, and then this year I read The Buried Giant, which is like this dark fable, it's just... Ah, but he's he's just got a way of writing, this way of connecting with the emotional core of what is happening. And it will touch you so deeply and so emotionally as you go through the book, even if it's something as minor as watching this little AI girl try and incorporate into a family or following these kids in this school and what happens to them there and then how they cope after they get out. There's not like these big sweeping plots that go on in this book. It's really just, there's just something internal happening in these books and it locks into your soul and doesn't really let go until you reach the end. It is kind of hard to quantify just how affecting reading a Kazuo Ishiguro book can be. Now we're into number three on the list, and this one kind of needs to come with a little bit of a disclaimer, because it is Haruki Murakami, and I do want to say Haruki Murakami is not for everyone. He is a strange writer. He is a little bit out there, and it's just like, He's writing strange stories that are like mysteries within mysteries and puzzles within puzzles. Actually, as a matter of fact, he described his book Kafka on the Shore as a book of puzzles within puzzles, and those puzzles will not come with answers. And the, you're just left with all of these questions and all of these mysteries once the book ends. And you just kind of lived in this strange world for a few hundred pages, maybe even a thousand if you're reading 1Q84. And then he just walks away. And you're just, oh, it's so good. Everything about it is so wonderful. Now, that's hard to get into for people. Just saying, hey, I'm going to give you a ton of mysteries and then I'm going to walk away and I'm not going to give you the answers. You could just kind of think about it on your own. That's a tough sell right there on the surface level. Then he's weird. He's going to put like some strange, mm, I think every book has got some like weird sex stuff and it's not normal. It's not natural. It's very out there and it's just off-putting in a big way for a lot of people. So just it's just kind of a hard sell on this Haruki Murakami guy. I mean, there are literal bingo cards that people have made. It's like Haruki Murakami bingo. And as you're going through his books, you're like checking off the spots of all the weird shit. 
that he throws into his novels that tend to repeat. And then we're, let's talk about the weird for a second, because, you know, you have authors like Jeff Vandermeer, who's like this weird author. You know, you read like the Area X trilogy or something, all this weird stuff's going on. Jeff Vandermeer is like in the shallow end of the weird pool. You know, he's like waist deep and he's just like kind of like the normal level of weird writing. Haruki's all the way out in the deep end. He's out there swimming, you know, I mean, just just out there, just really splashing around in some deep, weird shit, you know? So if you can handle like a Jeff Vandermeer and you're like, I wonder what the deep end of that kind of feels like, go tra- check out Haruki Murakami, but you might not like it. Just say it. Now, speaking of the deep end of weird, let's talk about Philip K. Dick, because he is number two on my top 10 list of greatest authors of all time. I love Philip K. Dick. I read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep was my very first book I ever read of his, and I was hooked. It was not even like a question. I just immediately went out and started reading more PKD, and it is just one of the greatest experiences that I've ever had reading is just picking up some of his books. Like, and and he's, speaking of the deep end of weird, we're talking like books like Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, where people are building like Barbie lands in their houses and then taking drugs to escape this terrible reality, which is this weird Mars settlement that they're on. But when they take the drugs, they actually end up in their weird Barbie land that they made in their house and they get to live and exist there for a while, all while some aliens are coming in on onto the planet from another universe i think i can't remember and then this other guy's coming back from another solar system and he's got a new drug that's going to take you even more crazy places than that barbie doll land ever could like you're just like what the fuck is happening here that's not to mention ubic which is like times moving in multiple directions at once while people are going to the moon and while people are in half-life because they whatever it's the amount of crap going on in a single Philip K. Dick book at a single moment in time is mind numbing. I just, it's, it's so hard to explain. Then there's this like deep seated thread that goes through the heart of all of his books. And it's this deep cynical sense of humor that he has. And it's just hilarious. It's just any of the dialogue between two characters in any of his books is innately funny because of just the 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 cynicism that's baked into it they're normally stuck in these dreary dreadful awful middle class lives they hate their jobs they hate their lives sometimes they hate their spouses and then they just have these dreary conversations that just illustrate just how awful these people's existences are. Oh, and, oh, and he's doing all of this while having some of the deepest conversations about life and reality. What is reality? What is consciousness? What is, and that's really the main takeaway that most people get from a Philip K. Dick book is those deep contemplative ideas that he's got baked into them. What is reality? What is a person? What is humanity? What is, you know, like do androids dream of sheep is really this deep contemplation on both religion and on reality and humanity but sometimes it's hard for people to get to those ideas because of all the other shit you've got to get through to get to them which is his weird sense of humor his weird writing style and all of his weird characters and worlds and just the stuff that he's got in there but for me that's what makes it so rich and engaging and just so wonderful ew oh my gosh number two Easily my second favorite author of all time, Philip K. Dick. Now, number one, and this one I feel is kind of controversial. I always get pushed back when I say this, and I don't understand why. But my number one favorite author of all time is Stephen King. It is not super trendy 
to say that anymore. Uh, it was back in the day. It was perfectly, I think he was everybody's favorite author there for a while. And I think still on the YouTube space, I think there's men of a certain age and above still all say that Stephen King is their favorite. Like, I'm 40, and I think pretty much any 40-year-old man and above on the internet is normally like, yep, Stephen King. You know, I'm in pretty good company. I think um, Mike from Mike's Book Reviews and Brian Lee Durfee, I'm in good company. And I think they all say that um, Stephen King is their favorite. And then you get down to the younger people, and they're all like Brando Sando or something like that. The, you lose King after a while. Anyway... Stephen King is my absolute favorite author of all time. And it's just, he's just so good. He can do anything. You want a fantasy book? He's got it. You want a horror book? He's got it. You want science fiction? He's got it. You want them all smashed together in one book? He's got that too. And none of those books are ever really about that. Like, for example, um, he has a bunch of horror books. He's famous as a horror author. But really, if you look at it, like take a book like The Shining. That's not a book about a haunted house. That is a book about a broken and struggling man. Take Pet Cemetery. That's not about creepy things coming back from the dead. That is a book about a grieving father. Then you have something like The Dark Tower. That's not a book about multiversal traveling. I mean, it is, but it's also a series about a, a bad man who has done bad things. But if you do so many bad things, is it too late for that person? Is it ever too late for a person? Or can they still come back from that? Can they still reclaim their humanity after they've passed a certain line? It's just, everything is so deeply personal and so deeply deeply emotional and so deeply about the characters. I think he even said once that his books are about characters. He normally doesn't focus too much on the plot and he's more invested on these people and who they are and what they're doing, which checks out if you've read a lot of Stephen King books. Sometimes he goes a little bit off the rails and he loses you. I'm not saying that every Stephen King book ever written is a masterpiece because he's got some stinkers. I've read some. They're not all great, but He's just so good at what he does, and he can speak to you on a, such a level. And then I've talked a lot about prose in this video, and he's not that guy. He's not the prose master. He has a very direct and down-to-earth way of speaking and way of writing. It's very not on a high level, and I mean that in the best way possible, but at the same time, even though it's real down here and real grounded, he has such a strong voice. You, it's almost hard to read a paragraph and not know instantly that that's a Stephen King paragraph. And that is a very fine line to thread while not being prose heavy, not being verbose, but somehow being extremely grounded. But then at the same time, having such a strong voice that you know right away who you're reading. That is a skill I don't even, I don't even know how to explain. But anyway, for me, it really comes down to his characters, the handling of his characters, and then the deep emotional themes that he will normally attack in most of his books and are normally about broken or sad or just deeply, deeply flawed characters. And we're going to live with them and exist with them, sometimes literally locked inside of their head for hundreds of pages at a time. And the skill that he handles that with is really, truly something special. There is a reason why he has become the like number one author of the last hundred years. It's not just schlock that the masses are eating up. This is deeply, deeply personal stories, and they deeply connect with a lot of people. And he's very, very talented as a writer. There's a reason why he is so highly regarded. Whether people want to admit it or not, whether you personally like him or not, whether he personally connects with you or not, that's not the point. There is, read a couple of his books, there is a very good reason why he is as popular as he is, in my opinion at least. Anyway, 
He is my number one. I would love it if you would give me your top 10 list down in the comments below. And as always, everybody, the link for my Patreon's in the description below. The link for my Discord's in the description below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.